Shall I start then? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. So question one. Uh, so I just have a doubt that how are they going to reply? Are they going to put their queries in the chat box? Answer in the chat box? Yes. You just ask the question. They will write their answer in the chat box. And how much time should we allow? Is there a particular time limit or it's okay? Uh, we can have 10 hours keys. Uh, half an hour we have. Yeah, so fine. So three minutes for discussion, probably max is a 40 seconds or one minute for answer. You can give so 30 what is seconds. The pulse? Yes. 30 seconds, right? Yes. So what is the pulse oximetry screening test? Mention the age at which the screening test is to be performed and how do you interpret the report? For CHD, 24 hours, done after 24 hours. For CHD, after 24 hours, done after 24 hours. Single SPO to more than 95 percentage. Less than 94, repeat after. Pre and post ductal SPO2 done after 24 hours. More than 95, less than 3, difference pre and post ductal. Yeah. I think it's uh, or most of you are correct. I'm not getting cursor. So uh, this is a pulse oximetry screening test. Basically, it is uh, done by applying a pulse oximetry probe. One is in the right hand and second, second one is in the either of the foot. So it is a preductal and postductal saturation difference, which is to be monitored or measured. It is to be done at 24 to 48 hours of the birth. If baby is being discharged earlier, then at, 24, uh, then at less than 24 hours. And how do you uh, interpret the report? So if the saturation is more than 95% in the hand, and if the difference is less than 2, less than or equal to 2, matlab less than 3 pre- and post-ductal difference, then the test is normal and screening is negative. If the SPO2 is less than 90%, and uh, then the screening is abnormal and one should go for the echo screening test. And if the result is in between, that is SPO2 is between 90 to 94 percentage in the hand or hand and foot difference, pre-ductal and post-ductal saturation difference is more than 2 percentage, 3 or more than that. In that case, uh, you need to repeat the test after 20 to 60 minutes and repeat is also same, then the test is abnormal. Okay, and if repeat is more than 95 percentage, then the test is passed. Okay, question 2. What is AADO2? Write down the formula to calculate AADO2. What is its normal value and which parameters can be used if PaO2 is not available? So other than AADO2, what would you calculate for the same purpose if you don't have a PaO2? What is AADO2? Come on, everyone. Alveolar arterial differentiation gradient. Normal up to 10. One to 30, 10 to 30.
What is the formula for the same? More than 300 OSI. Then 60 into barometric pressure minus 40 into water pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult to write down the formula in the chat box. Yes, correct. You all are good, huh? Yes. Seven thirteen into FR two. Minus PSO2 upon RQ, yes, respiratory quotient, yes. Great. So, alveolar artery oxygen uh, gradient or the difference that is AADO2, which means PAO2, that is alveolar oxygenation minus PAO2, that is the arterial oxygenation. So how do we calculate PO2? PO2, that is the alveolar oxygen, is to be calculated by the formula barometric pressure minus partial pressure of water vapor into FiO2 minus PCO2 and somebody has written RQ, that is right, but as it is a 0.8, sometimes for the quick calculation purpose, we'll take it one and we'll ignore this 0.8 value. So it is 760, that is uh, uh, at sea level, the barometric pressure, minus 47, that is the water vapor pressure. So that is seven, six, uh, 713 into FiO2. So if suppose the patient is on 100% of oxygen, then 713 into 1, minus PCO2, whatever your PCO2 value is. So in healthy infants, that AADO2 is less than 20 in room air because we are ventilating at 21 percentage of FiO2 and we assume the PCO2 of around 40. So it is less than 20 in room air. Calculating AADO2 allows the clinician to estimate the disease severity and more than 400 requires ECMO. So that is a severe respiratory failure. So in case if you don't have a PAO2, if you don't have an ABC report, then what are the things which you will calculate to uh, find out the severity of the respiratory disease? That is OSI, that is the Oxygen Saturation Index. And that has been calculated by MAP into FiO2 divided by SpO2. And if it is less than 7, it suggests mild hypoxic respiratory failure. 7 to 15 suggests moderate hypoxic respiratory failure. And more than 15 is suggestive of severe hypoxic respiratory failure. So OSI is the correct answer to... Uh, calculate the in absence of PO2, the disease severity. Okay, coming to question three, that is related to ABG. So here is a case scenario where preterm 30 weaker child was 1.2 kg on ventilator for RDS. This child had received surfactant for HMD. At six hours, the patient is on assisted control mode of ventilation or SIPPV, whatever you say, or uh, TTV mode. If you are in ventilating in the on this SLE 5000 or 6000. So in this mode, the patient PIP is 25, the PWP is 5. Tidal volume is 4 ml per kg, respiratory rate is 40 per minute, BPM is 50 per minute, and FiO2 is 0.3. That is 30 percentage of FiO2. ABG report in this settings is pH 0.46. PCO2 is 25, PO2 is 90, and bicarb is 18. So how will you interpret this ABC report? And what ventilatory parameter would you advise to change first with this ABC report? Respiratory alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis with metabolic acidosis, uncompensated respiratory alkalosis, primary respiratory alkalosis with compensatory metabolic acidosis. Decrease PIP. Respiratory alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis with compensation. 
with metabolic compensation, uncompensated, decreased rate. So there are two things confusing. One is decreased PIP or decreased rate. And one is whether it's compensated, whether it's uncompensated, whether it's a mixed etiology. Decrease PIP, some are telling to decrease the rate, some are telling to decrease PIP. The patient is on AC mode. Assisted control mode. Fine. So how do we interpret ABG report first? So whenever we are interpreting the ABG report, first check whether there is acidosis or alkalosis. That is a step one. Step two, whether this acidosis or alkalosis is metabolic or respiratory. Step three, check for the compensation. Step four, check for the oxygenation, whether there is a hypoxia or not. And step five, check for the ventilation. Step six, looks for other causes. Okay. So let's interpret this ABG report one by one. So step one is pH. So pH definitely is alkalotic. So that is the alkalosis. PCO2 is in lower side. So that is a respiratory. Step three, check for the compensation. So delta is CO3. That is the delta bicarbonate is 0.2 into delta CO2. So delta CO2 here is 15, right? The CO2 was 25 against 40. So that is 15. So delta CO3 is 3. So expected CO3 is 24 minus 3. That is 21. Our CO3, HCO3 in this report is 18. So measured HCO3 is le less than the expected HCO3. So that means there is a hidden metabolic acidosis. If measured SCO3 is more, more than the normal range, then there's a hidden metabolic alkalosis. So here there is a hidden metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. That is a mixed etiology. Uh, step 5, oxygenation. It is more than 80, then it is a hyperoxia. So what ventilatory parameter would you like to change? So uh, BPM here is 50 and patient is on AC mode with the CO2 being washed out. Okay. So, in this case, first is shift the child to SIME because there is no meaning in decreasing the rate if patient is breathing at the rate more than the rate you have set in the AC mode. So, if the patient is breathing at the rate of somewhere around 60, 70 and if you have set the BPM of 50, then come down on the, uh, then change the mode to SIMV and then gradually decrease the respiratory rate. The question four, what is resistive index? What is RI? What is resistive index? What is its normal value? What is the clinical implication of measuring RI in neurosonogram of an infant? Of an infant. Ventricular dilatation and IVH monitoring. Point seven to point eight is normal. Very few answers. Prognostic marker in birth asphyxia, 62.8. Peak systolic minus diastolic upon systolic. High in PDA, sepsis. SBP, DVP upon SBP. Fine. 
so let's see what is resistive index it's basically peak systolic velocity upon end diastolic velocity upon peak systolic velocity where your cursor is independent of the angle of insonation values below 0.5 is abnormal and even above 0.9 is abnormal. So how do you calculate it in sagittal view in neurosonogram where you just focus first on the meat sagittal that is the lady in dress view and after that you just focus on the interior cerebral artery there you just put the doppler and this is the interior cerebral artery doppler and in the extra axial window you may even find from the middle cerebral artery Doppler. So this is the MCA Doppler. That one was the ACA Doppler. And this is the peak systolic velocity. This is the peak uh, end, diastol uh, end diastolic velocity. So uh, RI is useful in the HIE. And due to the hyperinflation or due to the hyperperfusion or reperfusion injury, in diastole there will be a high flow. Okay. So the in diastolic velocity will be higher. In that case, RI would decrease. So it has a, it is associated with the poor neurological outcome. Again, it tells you about the um, time of impact. If immediately after birth, if you just do the neurosonogram, if you see that the RI is less, then the impact would have occurred even earlier. It is not only at the time of birth. And uh, second, it also tells you about the raised intracranial pressure. In case of rest ICP, end diastolic flow would have been decreased. And in that case, the RI would increase. So RI more than 0.85 suggests decrease in the diastolic flow due to raised ICP. And that will also help you out in deciding about when to tap, tap in case of hydrocephalus. So here you can see in this picture, this is a case of hydrocephalus and uh, where the diastolic flow is uh, reversed and the RI was more than 0.85 and after tapping, this Dopplers have become normal and RI has become normalized. Okay, so it will help you out in deciding when to tap in case of hydrocephalus. Okay, coming to question 5 that is related to pulmonary graphics. In this case, identify the type of ventilatory waveforms which has been shown in the uh, figure. Identify the problem in the graph pattern indicated by this arrow. How will you fix it? And what is the risk involved if you don't fix it? Great. You guys are very good at pulmonary graphics. Very quick response. Okay. Some says it's increased expiratory time. Some says it is air leaks. Some says air trapping. Is it trapping or leak? Some says auto peep. Air leak, auto peep, air trapping. Seen in bronchiolitis, asthma, air trapping. Pneumothorax is the risk involved. Fine. So this is basically a flow time scalar and this is an expiratory flow does not returning to the baseline causing air trapping and it has a risk of the pulmonary overinflation and ultimately the pneumothorax. So this is inspiratory time. Remember, only biphasic curve is uh, biphasic graph is flow flow graph. Okay, so this is a flow, and this is a time. So this is flow time scalar, and this is inspiration, and this is expiration. 
So expiration, this is a normal. The right hand side, if you can see, there is a inspiration is end, and then after that, the expiration has started. And here the expiration ended. At that time, the inspiration has started. But in the left hand side, what we can see is before expiration gets over, inspiration has started. That means that your E time is less, and that is why. Your air is being trapped inside and that will lead to generation of the auto peep. It is not an air leak. This is air trapping. Okay. So, uh, clarified, it is air trapping, not the air leak. And it can be fixed by increasing the E time, decreasing the rate or decreasing the I time, giving a proper E time. So, this can be fixed by giving a proper E time, increasing the E time. And if you don't fix it, that may lead to pneumothorax. Now question six, that is related to antenatal steroid and this we have already discussed in the case. It is the repetition of the same, which is the preferred drug, bitamethasone or dexamethasone and why it has been preferred, we have already discussed. What is the indication of antenatal steroids in the mother? Betamethasone less than 34 weeks. Dexamethasone widely available in India. WHO guidelines, Dexa. Beta if available. Indications somebody is writing multiple gestation. Twenty four plus zero to thirty three plus six. Yeah, that's correctly written. Twenty four plus zero to thirty three plus six, and dexamethasone is the preferable one, not thirty five. It's thirty three plus six. And not the betamethasone, dexamethasone. Betamethasone, if you, it's like whatever betamethasone available in India has no added advantage. So dexona is the preferred mode. Betamethasone acetate plus phosphate, which is required to be given 12 hourly interval, is not available in the India. Betamethasone phosphate, which is available in the India, is short acting, is more expensive is more unstable at the high temperature without any extra advantage and that is why the dexamethasone is preferred one. The pregnant woman between 24 plus 0 to 33 plus 6 weeks of gestations who are at risk of preterm delivery within 7 days irrespective of the growth of the fetus or whatever the single or multiple gestation is anticipated is to be given with the dexamethasone. Doses 6 mg each, 4 doses, okay, interval between the injection, 12 hours apart, deep intramuscular route, site of administration, preferably enterolateral aspect of the thigh, and the complete four course, uh, courses is to be given. And this is regarding the rescue dose, single rescue dose of the antenatal steroids may be considered if the mother is likely to be delivered within next one week. And if the previous dose has been received two weeks prior. Question 7. Identify this x-ray. Uh, what is... Uh, you? Identify the x-ray. What is uh, LHR and how it helps in prognosis of this situation?
CDA, CDH, le, lung head ratio less than 1.4 per prognosis, CDH. Lung heart ratio or lung head ratio? CDH, wonderful. So correct, this is the X-ray of CDH and LHR is not the lung heart ratio, but it is the lung head ratio here. It's a contralateral lung to head ratio. And if it is more than 1.4, then survival is 86%. And if it is less than one, then survival is even less, around 15%. So prognosis is, that is a good prognostication indicator. And that is to be taken between 24 to 26 weeks of the gestational age in the sonography. One can also go for the fetal MRI and check for lung volume, but lung head ratio is this. Coming to question eight, and that is a case scenario where it is a dumb infant who is normally delivered, normal vaginal delivery with thick MSL. There was a perinatal depression, child was intubated and gradually required to put on the high frequency ventilator with the MAP of 20, delta P of 40, FR2 of 70 percentage and frequency of 10. Uh, with this FiO2, the SpO2 of 92% on the upper limb and 69% in the lower limb. Guess is suggestive of so as it is written for 7.101 PCO2, PO2, bicarb and base deficit. Calculate OI. What is the implementation of the OI in a ventilated newborn? OI 40.57, severe PPHN 5.7, INO versus ECMO 57.1, 22, Be very hypoxic and needs to take more. Then ten twenty start I know. Okay. Fine. So oxygenation index is basically a map into FiO2 into 100 divided by PO2. So here FiO2 is 70 percentage and map is 20 divided by 35. So OI is 40. So when OI is more than 15, it needs inhaled nitric oxide and OI more than 40 needs ECMO. Some um, people take OI uh, more than 25 as an indication for inhaled nitric oxide, but those were initially. Nowadays, we are going more for, um, you know, lesser, uh, like even at lesser OI, we are starting with the inhaled nitric oxide. So more than 15, definitely one can start with the inhaled nitric oxide, depending upon the unit protocol. And more than 40 is uh, indicative of the need of ECMO. Okay. Question nine, what is the solution and what is its use and mention the content. What are the contents for the solution?
bacillosid, bacillosids, glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde, hypochloric acid, disinfectant. So different companies might have a different name for the same. That is, though it is of microchin and microclean is the name, there might be a sporolol, bacillol, depending upon the different company, but it is a surface disinfectant that has been used for cleaning the NICU, all surfaces, bassinets, lockers, monitors, working desk is also to be cleaned with this solution. And uh, it is to be cleaned once in each shift and uh, it contains its propanolol 1, uh, propanolol 2 and ammonium chloride. There is no hypochlorite. So just check it out which surface disinfectant is being used in your NICU and what is the content for the same. Whether you take a sporolol, bacillol or microclean, all of the disinfectant has the same content, propanolol and ammonium chloride. Okay, coming to the last question of the evening, that is question 10. Uh, that is related to ECG. This is the case scenario of a 36 week baby, one of the twin admitted for the TTN and developed heart rate of 220 per minute without any cause, without any reason, child was not crying. And this was the ECG, which was a uh, 12 lead ECG. Identify the possible etiology for the ECG and how will you manage this condition? Yes, sweetie, adenosine, rapid plus, adenosine, certain adenosine, rapid plus method, supraventricular tachycardia, adenosine, neonatal SVT. Yes. Fine, so all of you are right and good at identifying this ECG. This is SVT. So first and important thing is definitely adenosine, but then first and important is initial stabilization. Ensure the ABC, provide oxygen if needed. Here the child was absolutely fine. No other, need, uh, other things were required. Then vagal manure is the first thing which one can try even before trying for the adenosine. Okay, so attempt, attempt a manual like uh, putting eyes on the face, gentle pressure, deep oropharyngeal suctioning, valsalva manual. So these are all are the things which you can try to um, subside this episodes of the SVT. Then if there is, if it is still persistent, then one can try with the adenosine. That is IV, as you all rightly mentioned, rapid flush method. It is to be followed by uh, speed, uh, flush of sol uh, saline. That is rapidly. Then uh, consideration of other medications. If there is a recurrence or if there is a resistance with the adenosine, if the episode is not reverted, then one can think about procainamide or amiodarone antiarrhythmic medications. And cardioversion is the last one if the child is hemodynamically unstable. Fine. So 